when I first saw the uh, EY logo, uh, Better Working World, I always thought they were focusing on Workless. No, no, ab about <laughs> workers, about uh, a better place for people to work, not making the world work better. <laughs> it's actually but both. It's a little it's bit of both, right? So it's supposed to be a double. It's medium. really okay. Well, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I. Um, so I think the the idea about better jobs is a very direct reflection of the first interpretation, yeah. better working Absolutely. world. Um, and I'm going to be, uh, I just give a few uh, research highlights, if you will, of some studies that I've been working on related to employment issues and training issues in China. Um, and uh, I'm going to even be more ambitious than Anand yesterday, who presented two papers. I'm going to cite some results from three papers and then uh, uh, pose kind of a puzzle for the last topic. Uh, so I want to uh, broadly look at these four issues in employment, which I think are issues, uh, they resonate with the issues that have been identified by the World Bank Jobs and Development Group as well for priority research areas. Uh, area of informality and labor regulation, uh, education, training, and skill mismatch, structural change, how in particular in China are firms coping with rapidly rising wage costs, and are they upgrading, are they responding in positive ways, and then the issue of how technology is affecting jobs. And I'm going to present some results from studies that address uh, each of the first three and present a slide that presents interesting questions for the fourth. And for the second one, I'm going to focus on a paper that I've been working on on vocational uh, training in China. There's another uh, project that the World Bank Project is funding. I mentioned yesterday about how well college majors, the supply of different college majors is fitting the demand for those majors in the labor market in China. But I'm not going to talk about that. There are no results. OK, so labor regulation, uh, there's a lot of debate globally about what is the optimal degree of regulation of employment. Uh, there is this concern in emerging markets, as I mentioned yesterday, about enforcement issues as well. Um, in, in the research we've done, looking at uh, firm data, trying to understand how the labor law in China, the new aggressive labor law, has affected employment, we did find that the regulations uh, or the enforcement of regulations have impacted employment negatively. But in China, we know at the aggregate level, there's no big unemployment problem. So other sectors have clearly absorbed uh, the, the employment. Um, and so the lesson, I think, that we take from that research is that uh, the differential regulation or differential enforcement of regulations can really create costly distortions in the economy. In other words, um, if, you re if you enforce uh, a regulation on some types of workers or on the formal sector but not the informal sector or in some cities but not in other cities, you really put the cities that you're enforcing strongly on at a disadvantage or the firms that are being subject to regulation at a competitive disadvantage. And that leads to exactly the wrong types of resource allocation flows away from perhaps the more productive sectors of the economy. So uh, in China, there was this 2008 labor contract law, which significantly increased worker protections and also increased penalties for noncompliance. And there's still, I think, very incomplete picture of how these laws have affected operations in uh, China and employment in China. And that's what I want to focus on here. If you do kind of an international comparison of the degree of protectiveness of workers of the substance of these laws, the Chinese law as well as the Indian labor regulations are both come up as highly protective. The least protective in the world are the US and the UK, which provide the most kind of employment flexibility from the employer standpoint. We did a survey in 2009 working with the People's Bank of China, representative sample of people who had banking relationships with any bank in China um, in eight provinces. And we asked a bunch of questions about the labor law, how is it affecting your firm, and what has been your employment uh, during this period. And we did the survey in the fall of 2009. The labor law was implemented in 2008. And we asked questions kind of retrospectively about what things were like before the labor law at the end of 2007. And then, uh, in the first half of 2008, the second half of 2008, and the first half of 2009. We were also interested in looking at what 
was happening in terms of the financial crisis, which hit China severely in the fall of 2008. And you can see from this slide that uh, where we just asked him how strictly have labor regulations been enforced, that most of the firms um, at the time of the survey said that the law was being enforced either strictly or very strictly. And very few said it was not strict. But there was a lot of differences across areas. We asked another question about, has the labor regulations made it more difficult for your firm to hire and fire workers? A uh, third said yes, and especially on the firing, but also on the hiring. And so we want to ask a couple of research questions. What were the determinants of the labor law enforcement differences across different firms and cities? And then how did the city variation in the enforcement affect the impacts of labor law on employment changes? And we did a bunch of regression analysis, which I won't discuss. But uh, the conclusions of the, the main findings were uh, interesting. We found that in the cities that before the law had been implemented had relatively lax enforcement of the law, we saw a much bigger increase in enforcement uh, after the implementation of the law. Compared to cities that were already enforcing labor laws strictly, we saw a smaller increase in efficiency. We saw kind of a leveling of the playing field. So one unit stricter enforcement in 2007 before the law was associated with a 0.137 smaller increase in enforcement strictness, just measuring enforcement by 0, 1, 2. Not strict, very strict, uh, strict and very strict. And a one standard deviation stricter uh, enforcement level in 2007 led to a 3.2% greater employment growth over the subsequent 18-month eight, period. So it leveled the playing field, the enforcement of the law. And so it actually helped the areas with strict initial enforcement. There's another really interesting paper using Chinese listed firm data, which found that after the labor law was implemented, um, it was the labor intensive firms uh, actually did much better, uh, which was a surprise because you might think they would do much worse with higher labor costs. But they did better because the listed firms now had a much more even playing field with the non-listed and smaller firms who were facing very little actual regulation. So the fact that all of their competitors were getting more enforcement and they were already at a pretty high level of climates really helped them actually and their stock price increased. So it, it led to kind of a counterintuitive result. Okay, second question is about vocational education. So this is a huge issue, again, a, a very contested issue about whether countries should invest in general education to provide more uh, worker flexibility and learning, or whether they should actually train skills that are demanded in the economy and, whether, and that are more vocationally oriented. Of course, you have the German vocational focus system versus uh, American more um, general education focused system. The World Bank has tended to, um, in the past, advocate more general education. But recently, there, there's a lot of people in different country offices supporting vocational education projects. So um, long-standing debates. China uh, very aggressively expanded vocational education in the late 2000s. Um, and the question is whether this, this is a good idea, whether it's delivering returns. So we try to see what is actually the return, the wage return, to actually getting this vocational high school degree, which was the key focus of policy. Uh, there has been little evidence uh, previously. And this is just a picture of the percentage of middle school graduates who are going to vocational high school and this big jump in the late 2000s. Right? Uh, and there was an aggressive um, expansion of the supply of these spots and subsidized tuition, a um, bunch of efforts. And so we just did. Uh, We've been doing surveys. I've been doing surveys with the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences for a long time. Now we've done three waves of surveys in uh, five large Chinese cities uh, in different parts of the country. And so we've been surveying both migrant workers and local resident workers. And we asked very specific questions in all the three ways about vocational education, which is not available in most of the Bureau of Statistics uh, labor force survey data. And here you can see. The, the training of the educational attainment of the labor force in the city surveys, the local residents and the migrants, where if you look at the vocational high school for migrants, there is this big jump from 3.3% of all migrant 
workers having vocational to 5.67%. But still, you know, not the majority. Most of the migrant workers are middle school and below, 70% to 57%, with some increase also at the, at the higher end. Um, and local workers are much more educated than migrant workers. So we did a simple exercise of estimating the returns to vocational regular high school education and higher levels of education for local migrant workers. And then um, we looked at the returns across the same cohort age uh, as they get older, as they have more experience in the workforce. Some people have argued that the returns to vocational school are high initially, but later, as you have more years in the workforce, the relative returns start to work against you and the returns to regular education become higher. So here are the main results of just the return, the, the wage return to attending vocational high school. And you can see that it's interesting for migrant workers where there was this big increase in supply, the return has been going down steadily. So it's only um, a 24% return relative to going to uh, middle school or middle school or less. Um, whereas for local workers, it's been uh, going up or steady over this period. And then we did uh, analysis uh, using another data set from the National Bureau of Statistics where we added a question about the year that you graduated from middle school. And we used other data where we knew about the expansion of middle school supply in different provinces to use this exogenous expansion as a as an instrumental variable or a source of variation in your likelihood to go to vocational education to better identify the impact of that education on earnings. And we found no evidence of positive returns to vocational education, vocational high school education using this method, which is, is a bit stronger in its causal kind of ability to identify causal relationships. And so we conclude that the vocational education has not really done very much for increasing productivity of workers in in China, and the supply has led to a declining return to, the, to this area. Okay, and the last paper I want to talk about is the most recent, it's preliminary, and it's a, it's a paper about um, how Chinese manufacturing firms are reacting to these rising labor costs in, uh, in Guangdong province. And we did these surveys this past summer. Uh, just as background, the real manufacturing wage in China has doubled, basically, since from the period 2007 to 2014. This is uh, official Bureau of Statistics data. The relative wage of unskilled workers, proxied here by migrant worker wages from rural surveys in China, compared to kind of formal workers, uh, which is the official yearbook data, has shifted. In other words, the relative wage of migrants, or the, the most less skilled worker, was declining uh, until 2007, and since that time it's been rising, meaning that the unskilled wage has been growing faster than the skilled wage also over this past seven year period. So that's the most critical kind of wage pressure that firms are facing is this rising unskilled wage. Okay. So the question is, how are firms responding? It's, you know, whether they respond in ways that maintain or increase productivity is critical to think about uh, China's ability to kind of move up the value chain, to uh, take advantage of uh, the process of structural change. We could imagine some responses that are negative, that they just shut, shut down because they can't deal with the rising labor costs, or they downsize, and they just stop doing things that they can't do and keep doing things that they can maintain marginal profit margins. Some neutral responses where maybe they will relocate and continue what they're doing, but in a lower cost environment or something that's more positive where they actually respond and are able to shift to higher products, higher value goods, or shift production technologies more to capital or skill intensive uh, methods that allow them to still make profit in the new cost environment. And we are positing that the ability of firms to respond will also depend on their own characteristics or the environments that they faced. And so we try to see if it interacts with these different firm characteristics. Okay. And we did this survey. So uh, did it this past summer, mostly in August. 570 manufacturing firms representatively sampled uh, in 13 cities in Guangdong province. And we interviewed a random sample of 6 to 10 workers in each firm, where we actually asked the personnel uh, office to give us a whole list, a list of all the workers. And we randomly 
uh, sampled. And this was a collaboration with uh, several uh, other institutions in China, Tsinghua University, Wuhan University, and Chinese Academy of Social Science. And we have this plan to continue and follow these firms over time and expand to other provinces in the future. So if it works, it'll be quite ambitious and quite an important source, I think, of information for understanding what's happened in, in, in the industrial sector in China. If we ask the <coughs> firm managers what is the most important barrier you face, the labor cost has the most frequent responses where this is a prohibitive or extremely significant barrier, 70% of firms. The second most often cited factor is market demand, taxation, and then a lot of issues related to talent, right? Technical talent, your worker skills, your managerial talent. These are all issues. And these are much bigger issues than like financing, getting financing sources or getting cheaper sources of financing, which is often in many contexts the biggest complaint of firms. Um, okay. And these are all size firms, including small firms down. The lowest size is 25 workers. Um, so we asked a lot of questions about employment. This is the average breakdown of the labor force within firms in the sample. So two thirds are frontline production workers. Uh, there's about 7% seven, uh, 7 that are top or mid-level managers. And then other managers are 10%, 7% uh, technicians some salesmen and some other workers like janitors and guards and other types of personnel. If you look at wage changes, what jumps out here uh, is the much higher increase for the frontline workers or other workers compared to the skilled, more skilled workers, the managers and the technical workers. There's also a big jump in the salesmen, but this, this is a very small uh, part of the sample. And then if you look at the changes in employment in these firms, so these changes are from 2013 to 2014. Um, and also, we also have one measure from the first half of 2015. Um, but we look at the relationship between those things to employment changes between 2013 and 2014, and we see that on average, firms are downsizing. They're reducing the size of their workforces but it's almost all in the production workers, frontline workers. Managers are increasing. So this is evidence of some kind of uh, upgrading of skill in the firm. And then we ask these, qu these questions empirically. Um, is employment responding to wage changes? We're also looking at other responses, uh, investment, other things. Are those things responding to wage changes? And what factors intermediate this responsiveness of employment to wage changes? And this is the findings. Uh, these are preliminary. We found that employment in manufacturing, especially of unskilled workers, responds negatively to the level and change in the unskilled wages in the city. We're, we're focusing on city level wage changes. Um, so they're downsizing in response. Places that have higher wage increases are, are reducing their workforces by more. But this is less true for exporters who may be connected into value chains or be responding to contracts for production amounts that were pre-specified. So you don't see as a much responsiveness among exporting firms. Um, we also find that employment actually increases of all types, increases in firms that increase capital investment, indicative of complementarity between employment and capital. There's no evidence of a responsiveness of skilled worker employment or changing capital to wage changes. So they're not hiring more skilled workers or investing more when they face higher wages. So this suggests that the main response thus far has just been downsizing, which is a kind of a more negative outcome rather than upgrading um, in the data uh, thus far. And of course, that leaves a lot of questions about um, why that's the case, and whether maybe there are certain sectors where it's working better than others, et cetera. So we'll continue to look at the data and add to it as we get more data in future years. OK, last th teaser is this fourth topic about technology and jobs. And this is a slide that was presented in our conference that we just held a few days ago. It's a preview of the, this year's World Development Report, which is going to be released in January, and we'll have this figure in it. Um, so the conference was allowed to preview the main results of the, of the report. And this year's report is about the internet and jobs, so technology and jobs. And there's been a lot of discussion in the U.S. about the hollowing out of the middle class, 
which means that in, in the US, the nature of the skill distribution the workforce is such that there's been an increase in high skill jobs that cre require creative thinking and an increase in manual jobs that are not routine, that still require personal service. But this whole middle area of kind of jobs that could be re replaced by computers or technologies or, or anything that's routine, whether it's a skilled job or an unskilled job, if it's routine and can be automated, those jobs are shrinking, right? And it's led to increasing inequality in the United States. And what they did for this report is they did a similar estimate for many different countries about the change in middle school occupations versus high school occupations versus low school occupations. And they found this very consistent pattern that in most countries there was, just like in the US, a reduction in the middle skilled occupations, except for one country, two countries, China. Right? China, you have this huge increase in the middle skilled jobs uh, over this 1993. In China, I think it's the 2000 to 2010 period. Um, and so this raises lots of questions. The problem with these calculations is because nobody really knows what is involved in specific occupations in different countries, but this has been carefully codified in the United States. So in the US, you say any occupation, and there is a big survey done. They know exactly what that occupation does and how routine it is. And people have been using the US classifications, just applying them to the occupation codes of other countries. But it assumes that what people do in an occupation in the US is the same as what they do in other countries, which is a, probably a terrible assumption. And so the World Bank has been doing a number of surveys of skills and about tasks. What do workers do in different countries? Uh, and they've done it in about 12 countries just in the last few years. And we have a proposal to do this survey in China to unpack what's happening in the skills using China-specific measures of what people in different occupations are doing. And we're involved in a proposal working with people in Europe and uh, and the United States and maybe India to try to understand globally uh, kind of what, what this really means. What are the differences in the, in the tasks that workers of different occupations are doing uh, in different places and what country characteristics can predict those differences and once we account for those differences do conclusions like this about the nature of uh, the changes in the, in the job distribution across skill levels, does that also change once you are more careful about what people are actually asked, being asked to do in these different countries. So let me stop there. Uh, I'm just reflecting on this slide, and uh, thank you very much for, for the presentation. I thought that probably it's Part of the uh, explanation can be the difference in the starting position, because if we look at, for example, Turkey in 1993 and China in 1993, they probably had different structure of employment, and uh, there can be two, like, if, if, if we think of employment having generally upward trends in terms of skills, uh, Turkey losing, I mean, Turkey is number two or from the left, uh, as far as I understand. They, they could be losing uh, mid-level jobs to high-skilled jobs while uh, China was building from low skills to, to, to middle. So it's, it's, it can be not the same process structurally happening in, in all across the sample. Right. So I agree. Structural change could be explaining a lot of these patterns. Although it would be odd that it would happen in China, but not some other developing countries. Albert, very interesting uh, work. Uh, just also about this last slide in, uh, in China. I wonder if, uh, you know, outsourcing could be sort of part of this structure, a big structural change. I mean, what is considered uh, maybe certain kind of skills in uh, in the U.S. maybe will be considered uh, middle skill, middle level skill in uh, in China. And and I wonder uh, if if that is the explanation, then uh, why don't we also see, for example, y you could expect in uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, sort of Southeast Asian countries, you could also see uh, there was a spike in middle skill uh, f for for mid nineties, where we don't quite uh, right. There aren't yeah. that many other uh, Southeast Asian countries here. I think I think Nam is Vietnam, and so actually you don't see the increase in the 
in the uh, high skill jobs yet. Oh no, you do not in the middle skill, but it's more kind of moderate. So, but you're absolutely right. We need to we need much better information on what people are actually doing to make broad generalizations like this. I was a bit curious about your, your result that you were finding that employment was declining uh, most in, in uh, cities, in uh, provinces, in Guangdong, where wage growth is, is relatively highest. Right. So that seems like uh, labor, you know, that labor supply is driving, uh, is driving your results. So uh, what, what in, in your impression, was uh, driving sort of city-level differences in, in labor supply? Is it just cost of living or, or you know, local, access to local workers? Right. We're actually surprised that the, there's quite a lot of variation across cities in the wage changes. We thought you take different cities in Guangdong, maybe it's really an integrated, maybe it's one labor market, so that should make the wages move together a bit more. But that's not what the data seems to be telling us. So there must be these things that are either search costs or mobility barriers or something that are keeping people from moving across to other cities. Um, and um, I don't have a very, it actually, it's not what I expected. So I'm not, so therefore I don't have a very good, I think, uh, explanation for it. Originally, we were also worried that, you know, it would be demand shocks would actually work against us that, you know, some places they just had firms that were in sectors that were really hit harder. And so you would see employment change, but you would also see wages go down, right, if it's a demand shock. And so that would make you less likely to find this relationship of higher wages leading to lower employment. But, and that may still be true, that our estimates are underestimates if we kind of took account for the possibility that some of the wage changes are actually kind of driven by, driven by city-specific demand shocks. Yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about the distribution of firms in the sample by ownership type. You said yeah. there were manufacturing yeah. That they're probably predominantly privately controlled, but there right. could be collective uh, or predominantly state controlled or foreign invested ones. So, did you look at ownership? Yes, so I can answer that question. Yeah. We have almost no state owned firms, oh, okay. like maybe a couple. And then uh, it's very evenly split between private firms and foreign firms, and did you with more that, private firms. Did you look right. at whether private versus foreign firms are more sensitive to? Is the, we the did, and we didn't find a big difference. Oh, okay. Uh, in the responsiveness to wages. But I think there will be important differences, I think. Actually, it's a very good data set to look at the difference between domestic private firms and foreign firms in Guangdong because we have a very good, deep sample for both types. So, Albert, the, um, the rate clause, um, have you been able to match that to uh, unemployment levels produced by the government? Does it match up? I haven't tried. This is, st I'm stealing this from the World Bank report uh, presentation, but um, so I haven't, I've, I haven't done a lot of cross country analysis of these outcomes. Um, so I guess what I'm yeah. wondering is is there a bigger trend here around um, is this fueling unemployment or do those skills get moved elsewhere in the economy? Right. I mean, economists would probably say that unemployment is driven by other types of barriers to employment. Because this will just mean that jobs shift, right? Comparative, and people will always do something. They'll just do what there's a demand for. This is just saying for a lot of companies, you know, if they think, and it's a big issue in, in southern China right now where the government is actually encouraging firms to roboticize and automate to deal with this issue. Um, but if that, when that happens, there's just, people aren't hiring people of certain occupations, so people will just naturally do other kinds of work, right? So it, as long as labor... Uh, if they're, right, they get displaced, so this is an adjustment cost. Can workers adjust and find new work? I mean, you might argue that it's easier to do lower skilled jobs, right? So do they go but that, and that would be an issue, right? I think it's certainly related to inequality levels. A wage inequality in the U.S. has been linked to this pattern by labor economists in the U.S. MKD. Mas what? Macedonia. <laughs> Macadamia. <laughs> I, I don't know. Macarena. <laughs> so it's really increasing. It's getting more low skilled employment. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, yeah something ha happened. And, and it is hollowing out. Uh, it's just that it's an extreme, yeah, so I'm yeah, curious yeah. which country that is. Which. This is a bit too extreme to take probably seriously. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. On, on, yeah. And it was on the previous one. On the vocational one, yeah. it, it strikes me as a question of whether the policy of encouraging vocational education is actually not working, right? Has it worked in other markets? In other words, if you look outside, so this is this is China specifically. Right. So there have been. If you look at other studies, is there better outcomes in terms of wage growth and, and positive returns? Uh, I would say the results are mixed okay. um, in other countries. And there, there, there's been a lot of criticism about vocational schooling in China that they expanded too quickly, the schools were not credited, they were set up to grab government subsidies and not really, you know, there are all these stories about lo reasons for low quality vocational education which may be important. In other words, these findings don't necessarily mean that you should not do vocational education, it might mean right. that you need to fix vocational education, right, right if you thought about it that way, but, uh, you know, that's kind of beyond what we, what we can do here. Um, so I don't know what the right mix is. There's, it's, it's very hard in general for countries to think about what is the right mix of training for their labor force at a given point in time because they should be thinking into the future, right? We educate people today. What are the jobs of the future going to be? But that's kind of hard to anticipate sometimes. At the same time, there's a lot of jobs that need to be done now, and there's demand. So should you try to train people for today's needs or to the future needs? And those sometimes may be in conflict, right? So and there's no easy way to resolve those tensions. Yeah, yeah I, I actually had a question on, on that same line, but whether you looked at the variance in the return to vocational school <coughs> education, that might <coughs> that might be some some indicator of, of differences in quality or, or of some of the problems that. Uh, that right. No, we haven't. That's a very good suggestion. And I, I have a colleague who's been doing some other surveys in China, and I convinced her to add a few questions to this uh, survey, and I'm just getting the data where we asked what major, what did you study? For, these surveys didn't ask exactly what did you study. And then another question, in your current job, do you actually use what you studied? <laughs> so that will be helpful to sort out this heterogeneity, I think, and whether it helps some people and not, not others. Uh, high school level vocational education, which means like Zhongzhuan, it means Jishao, it means, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's several types, but they're all, at the, they're all upper secondary level, yeah. Not, 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 up, not, not college level. Mostly now, this vocational secondary school were built by those really before they don't have didn't have any chance to go to school, right? So and the, this is more run like a business. Those vocational school trying to grab you know students uh, from rural areas who may not get any chance to, to right, manage, right, right, and with subsidies, yeah. which yeah. also distorts everybody's subsidies. incentives. And, yeah. And, yeah, but but recently you see the Chinese government, right? Their policy was trying to convert those. Uh, before could be like tertiary schools, right? Right. Converted to this more applying the polytechnic, uh, uh, you know, university or or three or four years right. college, right? Those right. probably are, um, uh, you know, the Chinese government are now uh, uh, trying to focus on um, this the quality, vocational, the quality and the vocation. But right, it's right. Uh, it's more upgraded. So maybe you should look at uh, not the four year college, right? But at least uh, those part of the the the, the zhuan ke da zhuan. Right. right. So the vocational college because is basically. Because over time, over time, right? Now is that uh, the over time probably because of the education expansion, right? So before maybe 10 years ago, the uh, uh, vocational high school, right? Now they've been up, uh, upgraded, right? So if right, right. So there are a lot of quality people, issues about, because China had a huge expansion of higher education in the first yes. half of the 2000s yes. and has continued. But they also had quality issues because they were letting anyone, they were upgrading really inferior institutions and calling them colleges to meet this demand. And hopefully over time they've improved those. But that hasn't been studied very well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much.